Welcome to Sausage on a Fork, a podcast dedicated to the UK's longest-running children's drama programme, Grange Hill. My name's Neil, and in each episode, I'll interview a former cast member about their life before, during and after their time on the programme. Welcome to the next episode of Sausage on a Fork, and I am absolutely delighted to say that I have been joined by none other than Adam Sop, who played Darren Clark. Adam, welcome to Sausage on a Fork. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Not a problem, not a problem. So what we'll do, Adam, is we'll, we'll start the way we start every episode, and we'll go all the way back. And if you can tell us how you got into acting, so I started going to uh, an after-school dance and drama class when I was about, I don't know, like five or six years old. I was pretty young. And uh, it was a place called D&B Theatre School. And they used to come to my primary school and they'd do like a, a Thursday class afterwards. And I went along. And then when I was about, yeah, seven maybe, they said to my parents that they were going to start an agency for children. Right. And did I want to be one of the first people on the books? And my parents said, yeah, as long as it doesn't interfere with schoolwork, then, you know, they'd, they'd be up for that. Yeah. And so I started going for auditions and it was uh, it was like a whole new world, kind of leaving school on a school day to go into like, the West End and audition yeah. and stuff. And so I was really lucky in, um, in 1995, I got my first job. I was in Oliver in the West End. Right. I played uh, the youngest member of Fagan's gang. It was right. Nipper. Right. It's in a little box. Um, so, yeah, we're on stage, my my debut was at the London Palladium with Jim wow. Dale. A pretty, pretty cool way to start out. And it's been you know downhill ever since. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then, yeah, after that, that led to um, getting an audition for Les Miserables. And so right. I played a little young Gavroche in that a year later. And then the uh, following year, I did a panto. Uh, Peter Pan at the Seacombe Centre, uh, and then the year after that, it was it's quite funny. So I got offered, you know, you, you, you as an adult actor, you're always hoping to get the next job. As yeah. a child, I was offered two jobs at the same time. I got offered the original West End cast of Whistle Down the Wind, right, and I also got offered the part in Grange Hill. Uh-huh. And I said to my agent, as a very wise eleven year old, I said, "Listen, I think I've done done the West End a few times. Maybe it's time for some television." <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so I then moved into uh, into doing some TV and joined Grange Hill. Brilliant. Oh, you've just mentioned Jim Dale there, eh? all the Carry On films and Pete Dragon. But was there anyone else that you, you got to work with in those days? Yeah, I mean, I worked with uh, Ruthie Henschel, who right. was a, a bit of a legend. Um, John Owen Jones was in was in Les Mis as like a, a played Baron Boy, um, uh-huh. who's like now a massive you know West End leading man. Yeah. Um, uh yeah uh, do, do you know what jenny galloway was uh was right. in les mis and then she was then in grange hill playing uh-huh. um uh, i was about to call her my real name Lindsay, uh she who played amy in right. my my year of grange hill she played her mum oh right yeah yeah um, yeah uh so yeah so yeah there was some there was some some cool people i yeah. got to work with even that early on yeah brilliant so you, you mentioned grange hill there so I take it you auditioned. You had to audition for that one, then. Yeah, I, I got sent some uh, some scenes. Uh, in fact, I got some sent sent some scenes of uh, the character of Adam, uh, right. who was a couple of years above me in the show. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I went and I auditioned for the casting director, and then they said, "Would you come back?" And I met uh, Diana Kyle, who was the producer at the time. Right. And uh, my agent had said, if they ask you if you've ever done any television, which they might do, you must say yes. Right. And I'd, <laughs> and I'd said, but I haven't done any television. They went, it doesn't matter. You must say yes. And if they say what, you're going to say that you were in casualty. Right. And so I went in and so I, 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 looking back at it, it must have been so transparent that I was really confident, did the audition. And they went, have you done any TV before? And I went, yes, I've been in casualty. <laughs> And they're like, oh yeah, was it a speaking part? And I went, yes. And that was that. And so thankfully they uh, they either saw my lie and went, yeah, he's probably been told to say that, or <laughs> I was so convincing. But yeah, I got offered the part um, not long after that. And yeah, kind of my whole world slightly changed, to be honest. Yeah, no, this, this always a, sounds like a stupid question to ask a kid, because obviously at, at that time, what was it, 1998, you were filming, I imagine. Um, yeah. It was on telly in 99. That's right. Yeah. You, you were obviously aware of Grange Hill. Were you a fan of Grange Hill? 
at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I was de- yeah, I I was definitely aware of it. I I think I might have watched it. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was a while ago now, but um, <laughs> yeah, I was definitely aware of it, and I remember knowing of knowing about it when I was asked to go and audition for it. I remember uh-huh. yeah, being yeah. aware of its existence certainly. Yeah, so so late. So what was it like? Because obviously you joined as a, a year seven cohort. It was mm-hmm. always a first year when I was at school, the, the first year cohort, but it was a year seven cohort. So what was it like joining the show? Because obviously you joined as a, you know, there was a, a small crew of you, wasn't there, that mm. that joined? Like, so what, I mean, so what was it like? Yeah, it was to... good. They, they hadn't done a new year the year before us. So mm-hmm. the year, um, there was like a little gap between... Uh, um, I'm trying to think who was the direct year above us because they were like Dan Lee who played Ben yeah, and Amanda Fay. they actually joined after us playing the year above us right I get you um, but I think the year above us had been like uh, John March and Heatley and John Hudson yeah. and Rob Stewart and Charlotte they the Double Dare gang I think had been the most recent year right. so um, yeah they were kind of like the ones we kind of got to know to begin with um, uh-huh. because when you're a child actor you can only work for a certain number of days a year right and yeah. you have to do tutoring every day until you're, you're 16 years old uh-huh. and then once you're 16 in the eyes of the law you are an adult and so you don't need a chaperone you don't need tutoring they don't sort out your transport to and from the studio so right. there was quite a divide between the under 16s and the over 16s yeah. so the sick formers and the slightly older characters you 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 know you might you be on set with them occasionally or you might be in the canteen at lunchtime with them but apart from that you didn't spend that much time with them whereas you know, the under 16s, we all kind of were banded together and had to be in, yeah. in tutoring for those hours. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time with those guys. And, yeah, yeah, we were treated really well. You know, they, they, you're so green when you go into it and you don't really yeah. have a clue what's going on. I remember getting taken into um, Diana Kyle, who's the producer, into her, her um, office. Because we, we, got, we got brought in like a day before we'd started filming just to have a little like open day. Uh-huh. And uh, she she got the, the 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 five of us into her office, and she said, "It's a real cliche in television, but time is money. And <laughs> when you're on set, there's a lot of people. There's all the people in the camera department, the art department, props, sound, lighting. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of people, and we pay them all by the day, and we have a schedule to keep. And if we are kept waiting for even one minute by you." <laughs> Think of how many people I have to pay yeah. per minute and how much money that cost the BBC and everything. It was quite, it was laid on quite thick to us. Yeah, you know, I can imagine. Way, but, you know, yeah. you know d- don't be late. Don't keep people waiting. Don't be unprofessional because if you do, then, you know, you'll be yeah. out, out on your ear. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, that's that stuck with us. I mean, maybe not as much as it should have at times. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, that, but yeah. that's, that's quite a big thing to say to a, what, an 11 year old we're here at mm-hmm. the time. Like, so, yeah, I mean, that is quite a, a big thing to say. So, you mentioned there, we've mentioned that, you know, there was the, the five of you. Yeah. Was there anyone that you were sort of, you know, closest to or, or best friends with? Yeah, m- me and Arnie, Arnold O'Cheng, we, yeah. were, we were thick as thieves. Right. We used to get in quite a lot of trouble. <laughs> right, okay. And you mentioned you had Alison Bettles on the podcast uh, yeah. before. So, her mum, June. Yeah was the head chaperone. Yeah. And she was like a kind of a Grange. I mean, I think she was in Grange. June was in Grange Hill longer than anyone else. <laughs> you know, she yeah. she lived and breathed Grange Hill. And that open day that I mentioned, the first person you met was June. Right. And there were like other chaperones and, you know, tutors and, and producers and whatever. But they would, you know, they would do a couple of years and maybe go on. A couple of, couple of, tut- uh, a couple of chaperones, like Sue, who was June's best mate. She was <laughs> always there. But yeah, the two of them, and it was definitely June ruled the roost. Yeah. And she would always be shouting. Because Arnie was, uh, I mean, I say this now because he's not here. Arnie was a bit more naughty than I was. <laughs> right. <laughs> but because we were always mates and we were always together, we'd always get lumped in together. So if Arnie got in trouble, I got in trouble. Right, and yeah. You'd always hear June <laughs> shouting, Arnie, Adam! <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, we, we used to cause some mischief 
Brilliant, brilliant. So, as as you said there, you know, your, your first series was Series 22, which went mm-hmm. on in 1999. Darren was mates with Calvin and kind of mates with Spencer. And obviously there was a, a Nika and, and Amy as well. And it, it was it was a weird one with, with Darren and Spencer because... Spencer in in those days was uh, was was horrible, wasn't he? He wasn't he wasn't very nice at the start, and Not at all. and good on Darren because Darren was like, this, this isn't right. What he's doing here, like you know, you know, he what because he what you know, Spencer was picking on on Amy quite a bit, and I, I, I Darren did a little bit, um, but then he sort of realised. So what are we doing? Are we just going to pick on it? And he was like, well, yeah, you know, it, it's fun. Like, and and I just love the fact that he was like, well, I'm not, you know what yeah. I mean? But then. We had there was a bit of a turn then because Spencer then started having a go at Darren, didn't yeah. he? You know, and he. But then that sort of led to your first kind of real storyline in the eighties. We had the donkey in the shed, and then in the nineties we got the rabbit in the hutch. <laughs> yes, <laughs> didn't we? Um, <laughs> which I mean. See it nothing, but it, for me, it, it was like it was the perfect storyline for Darren because he was such a nice kid. You know, mm-hmm. I always think that he was a he was a really nice kid, and it just seemed really, really, a really, really good storyline to have for him looking after the rabbits. But in that, in those scenes, you got to work a lot with Lee Corns. Lee Corns, the one and only. Yeah, he was amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, what I mean, was he like? What was he like to work with? Like, he was hilarious. I mean, it, the guy is just funny. Yeah. Like, he's you work with certain actors, and you, you kind of quickly realize some people have a certain skill, and some actors you work with are just funny, even then when they're not trying to be funny. Uh-huh. And it's a rare gift. And I've only worked with a few who really have it, and Lee's definitely one of them. He's just, if he's not careful, he makes everything funny right. and it's almost like he has to work at not doing it he's such a comedic guy but he was great i remember it very early on in that storyline section it was like one of the first scenes we had with just me and him uh-huh. he just looked at me and went they tell you that you should never work with children or animals <laughs> so i don't know what mistake i made but somehow i'm here yeah right you no know, he was just a just a really lovely guy he was always always happy to be around you know some there were a lot of children on set, naturally, yeah. with it being Grain Chill. And some, uh, you know, some people like working with kids. Some people tolerate working with kids. Lee was definitely enjoyed it and was always yeah. up for a laugh. And were, you, were, you, were you aware of him before you worked with him? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, the, uh, I knew of Mr. Robson and I knew of Mr. Hankin, definitely. Um, but yeah, you- I'd... He didn't feel like uh, an ego walking on set or anything, you know. But you, but you, really you, 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 were, you weren't aware of Lee Corns from anything else because he'd done quite a bit of comedy. Well, stuff, yeah, I remember that. watching Blackadder maybe, maybe like a year or so into the show, yes. and him popping up and being like, "Oh my word, that's <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, what a yeah. career!" And what was the in general the relationship like between the kids and the adults? It was good. It was good. I mean, I think if as an adult you're signing on to do a show like Grain Chill, you've got to recognise that you're going to yeah. be working with a lot <laughs> of kids. But um, but equally, you know, we we had that chat on day one, and yeah. occasionally they would have to put their foot down and say, you know, you're being badly behaved. But yeah. it's in your nature as a kid to push the boundaries, and you know, and life imitates art yeah. quite often and so you know there were some days i remember you know it's yeah. like when you're a teenager i mean there's one day it was, it was a couple of years into the show me and arnie were filming on location somewhere near a duck pond that's all i remember i can't remember why we right. were outside but we were and it was summer holidays so we didn't have to do tutoring and we had a they there was like a, a scene at the beginning of the day and a scene at the end of the day. So we had quite a while to just be waiting around. And we just were in a mood. We were going to just be horrible. We were yeah. just going to cause <laughs> mischief and be annoying and loud. And I, and yeah, days like that, I look back and I think, yeah, they, the adults must have got yeah. really. Just, just being a kid, basically, weren't you? Just that, being that was... a kid, just being a 14 year old, 13 year old, you know. Yeah. We were, uh, yeah, we certainly raised, raised some hell. Because the days when, 
it was like a few people in a scene, if there was just two of you or three of you, it, it was generally right. But those bigger days, especially when you did like um, arriving at school or leaving school, those big playground scenes, you'd have yeah. you know huge number of extras. And uh, uh, I remember what they they had a slight change when I joined the show. They were telling me that they were gonna they wanted to do it a bit more like ER. Right. Quite, quite a grand design. They were like, yeah, really like ER. But lots of steady cam shots. So they yeah. had a, a new cameraman, a new piece of equipment called a steady cam, which meant they could move around and go from kind of storyline to storyline and weave the whole thing together. And that would mean there would be a lot of rehearsal and everything had to happen at the right time. And, you know, if you were not paying attention, then you could ruin it for a lot of people, which <laughs> right. quite often would happen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, I get that. Like, so we've talked a little bit about the rabbit refugee, and um, that storyline. That that there was like a. I, I, I tried to work it out why this bit happened. There was like a, a set time on when the it was must have been coming to the end of school term or something. When if no one had claimed the rabbit, then Dad would be able to take him. And at the last minute, someone someone turns up uh, yeah. to take the rabbit, which had been missing. I don't know how long it'd been missing for. But it all turned out well in the end because they they also had another rabbit. Yeah, they gave him little refugee to Darren. Now, moving on then to the next series, which was obviously series twenty three. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned earlier, and, and a lot of people mentioned about you know the, the the laws, the working laws, and the hours and all that. Now I looked, you were in every episode of series 23 even if it was only for like a, a scene or like a line or something because obviously when i do my research i go through your storylines and i look and all that and i had to read the synopsis for every single episode of series 23 and try and find <laughs> and try and find you clips like on you know you- it intimately now <laughs> try and find clips on youtube because <laughs> darren was in at least i'm sure it was every episode and again you know friends with spencer but Spencer has started showing some racist tendencies mm-hmm. because of his dad. And because of his dad, yeah. There's a, there's a bit where I think Spen- Spencer's got Calvin and Darren over with him. And yeah, I that, know that scene well. When we'd clean up his house. Yeah, well, uh, before then, there was, the, there was the play fight, if you remember that. There's a play oh, fight, yeah. and Spe- Spencer actually says, well, you know, blacks versus whites. And Darren says to him, what what is it with you? Like you know, what's wrong with you? Like Darren could see that Spencer was like that, and we had that series. That series then from that focused on, and it, you know, Grangeil was great for this for bringing in storylines that had never been shown on kids' telly in this Absolutely. way. And there was a the child neglect storyline because Darren's dad had gone on the run because he he knew that. He, he, he attacked someone. Didn't necessarily think the police were after him, but he went to, he wants to stay away. And Darren's mum went with him to look after him. Oh, so you mean it's Spencer's mum? Spencer's mum, sorry, had gone away. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, Spencer's mum had gone away to look after the um, the dad. Mm-hmm. And again, you, you've mentioned there then the, the tidy up scene, which, I mean, it looks great when you watch it. I mean, you, you must have had a laugh film on that one. As well, well, the like... reason I remember it is because they uh, they said to us, we're going to do this kind of montage thing and we're going to speed it up. So right. it's going to look really, really good with you, like, all, you know, moving around, tidying really, really quickly. And we'd obviously got that into our heads. And so when they we, we rehearsed the shot and stuff, and as soon as they called action, we all started moving really quickly. <laughs> and they had to be like, no, 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 guys, 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 you just go normal speed and we're going to speed it up afterwards. Um but yeah, it was it was a uh, yeah it was good fun. There was, yeah. I mean, there was like some sort of weird something about making some food or eating some weird food. Right? Yeah, that was. I think there was something later on when Dad had a jar of something. He wasn't feeding himself, and so we tried to make him some food. Yeah, to yeah like there was. I mean, sandwich or something. Yeah, but they realised that Dad and Calvin realised Spencer was alone, basically, and they wash. Spencer and his clothes in the bath. <laughs> yeah, God, I've forgotten that. And again, I just, you know when you watch it, and I just think, God, they must have had just had a ball doing all doing all this stuff. Like, so, yeah, and Colin had to be in the bath fully clothed. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was in the bath and clothed. Yeah. What that what that then led to was them get, asking Amy and Anika to come round and help because 
Gales know how to get things clean, one of the, one of the lads said. And Darren, being Darren again, said, it's a bit sexist, isn't it? <laughs> but Spencer's mum eventually comes home and Darren and Calvin didn't know Spencer's mum had come home. And they had a key to uh, Spencer's house. And they go into the house and they hear someone in the bathroom assuming it to be Spencer. <laughs> and they burst into the bathroom <laughs> to find Spencer's mum in the bath. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, God, I'd forgotten can, all can of I, this. Can I ask, without this sounding too creepy, was, was she actually in the bath when you went in the bathroom? I mean, I, I have, I, you have unlocked a memory because I'd forgotten any, any of this even happened. I would assume no. Right, so okay. I would assume <laughs> they would have shot it with us doing the reaction and then we would have gone right. off set and they would have had the actress who played Spencer's mum in yeah. the bath at that point. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I can't really remember to be honest. <laughs> no, no. And then I mentioned just, just a little bit earlier that Darren had his, they were doing a competition I guess the substance competition for there was like a charity thing going on and Darren had a jar with something in and Spencer's dad had, had come back at this point and was still showing, you know, the he didn't like the fact that Spencer had been mates with, with Calvin with Calvin and, and Anika. Anika. So he, <laughs> Spencer got the jar from, from Darren and it had, he, Darren said it had old mashed potato from the canteen and mould that they've been going from the science lab, and Spencer then went and put it in his dad's tea, and I just love the fact that uh, that bit. I know, I know, I know. I've mentioned Spencer quite a lot, but I think, <laughs> I think for your for your cohort and your group, series twenty three was more about Spencer than yeah, anyone yeah, else so. in, yeah, in that group. And also at the end of that, uh, Spencer's attitude towards racing had changed because obviously he was mates with with Calvin and Anika. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, you know, that was the reason why it, it, it changed. So obviously, um, Darren was at a, you know, a positive influence on Spencer. But at the end of that series, Linford Christie was the there. fate. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Did Did I you get what was, did you know Did you get to like you know meet him, talk to him? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. God. So we were doing. Um... Was it like, was it a firework? It was night the, or It something? was the bonfire because they'd been collecting the the cardboard and and stuff. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, because you'd never really filmed evenings, it was really? always filming yeah. during the day, because night shoots, you know, everything in TV always comes down to budgets and money. Yeah. And yeah, night shoots are more expensive. And so, um, yeah, it was like a rare thing that we were we were doing a night shoot. And those big set pieces were always fun because you had loads of extras, yeah. and so there was like more people on set to have fun with. And yeah, I remember us getting very excited because we knew that I don't think it was going to be Linford Christie to begin with. I think it's going to be someone else. And so I think someone less famous and whoever it was, they dropped out. And so at the last minute, the producers managed to get a replacement and it was Linford Christie. Yeah, we did get to meet him very briefly when we turned up in a very nice car. And he was like, it, it was like he turned up, he did his scene. We shook hands and said hi to him. And he said hi to him and then he was off. Yeah. I mean, he must have been there for the, you know, about half an hour. But, yeah. Um, yeah, God, I'd forgotten that. I mean, that must. Have, I mean, I, I just think that it must have been great because you know he was he was huge, wasn't he? You know, at, at the time, he oh, was yeah. a bare, bare big star. Like, and it was, was it? a it was actually a second appearance in Grange Hill because he'd been in it early nineties. He'd been in it as well, like early nineties, uh, uh, late eighties, no early nineties. Yeah. So then we move on then to series twenty four. Which was probably it was your you know your biggest storyline. Ah, uh, yeah, with the, with with, a, with, Amelia. with a, Amelia, yeah. So, do you want to explain what sort of the background, if you can remember, what sort of the background was to Amelia coming so, in? So, I mean, the short version is there was a refugee living in my loft. Right. Yes. But the lot. I think my parents were a little bit hippie-ish. Yeah. I think they'd been kind of involved in some sort of community action project and they'd found out that there was somebody who'd had their asylum appeal rejected uh -huh. and they'd something to do with war. I mean, I remember because uh, BBC is always funny about, or they used to be funny about names of places. They had yeah. kind of made up <laughs> places like Holby is a made up yeah. place for the BBC. And uh, they, this, character of Amelia was an was an African refugee 
and she was from the BBC's made up African country which is East Uhuru. Yeah. <laughs> which doesn't exist anywhere on a, on an actual map, but the BBC decided that's where she was from. So, yeah, she was she was estranged from her father for some yeah, reason. She was living in my loft, but my parents hadn't told me that she was living in my loft, yeah. and I found her so, somehow. Like obviously I've, you know, for research for this, I've watched it and it it, it becomes sort of quite sinister when when you watch it as an adult. The mm. fact that the parents are, uh, are stopping him from going in the loft because he's heard his parents talk about how much trouble we're going to get in if the police find out. Then every time he sees his parents putting stuff into the loft and he's wondering what it is and he, he's, he's trying to be serious with, with his mates about it and they're saying, oh, there must be, you know, he's a smuggler or there's dead bodies or or something. And then it was just, no, stay out of there. And you can see, and, and there's times when you're thinking, I wonder what they have got up there as an adult. And you start thinking of all bizarre things like that. It, yeah, it could yeah, be. Yeah. And again, he hears about he hears his parents saying about, we can't tell Darren, you know, we've got to protect him. And and then the, his parents are even advising him to go and stay with his mates, you know, like kick him out the house for the night and all that. And you, he must have been thinking, oh my word, what, what, what is going on? But then as you say, he finds... He, he go one night he wakes up and he go he hears a noise and as he goes onto the landing, there's a girl coming down the out of the loft and obviously his parents had had, had, had taken this girl in. She was due to be deported mm-hmm. and then she went missing and she was in in Darren's she house. In, she was living in my loft. Yeah, and it Darren Darren being Darren didn't want his parents to do it you know he was at first it was like you know it's against the law it's illegal and all that and then but then he came round to their mm-hmm. way of thinking did you have a, any sense sort of sense of wow you know i'm getting i'm getting a, a, a major storyline here at that yeah time? like I, I was aware uh that when i first got the scripts that you know this was going to be uh yeah a much bigger storyline for darren because you know as, as you say like I, i'd been in every episode of the previous series and uh you know, I'd I'd never felt like I hadn't had had enough airtime and stuff, and I'd had the the rabbit yeah. thing before. But yeah, season twenty three, the previous series had very much been Spencer's storyline, and yeah. and Calvin and I were were part of that. But yeah, it was it was lovely to get the scripts through and suddenly be like, ah, oh, I get to do the fun stuff this year. Yeah, and I get to do, you know, the kind of because the. the when you're involved with someone else's storyline, you get to do some stuff, but the actual really fun stuff, generally that's that's the scenes they've got on their own in their storyline. So yeah, when seeing that, I was like, this is, yeah, this is going to be a, a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, and Lashan Jolly, who played Amelia, was really lovely because obviously she'd, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. I came into the show as part of five new people uh-huh. and we became a, you know, a close group. Um, but when you come into the show on your own, it, I think it can be quite daunting, and um, she was really lovely. Took to everyone, became friends with everyone really quickly, and um, yes. and yeah, because we, we, you'd film like six months generally was was the time it took to film a whole series. Yeah, and uh, you we didn't film weekends that often. Right. Generally, it'd be Monday to Friday, uh, and you wouldn't go to school the days that you were filming. So you'd go to set all day, and you'd have to do three hours of tutoring. But then the reason they did the six month thing is because it meant that actually only three months would be during term time. And then another two, three months pretty much yeah. would be summer holidays. Yeah. And the majority of that storyline was, um, yeah, was during summer holidays. So I remember, yeah, me and Lashan just spending a lot of time together, especially once because uh, she runs. Uh, yeah. So she's living in my loft. I eventually find her and then I try and she's getting bored because she's yeah. just in the loft all day. And so I think I tell my friends yeah. and I say, why don't we smuggle you into school? And so she comes into school with us, uh, but she doesn't have a uniform or maybe she yeah, borrows so, so a uniform. Yeah, so get bits of uniform from everyone, yeah. yeah. And we have to keep hiding her from teachers. Yeah. Uh, and then meanwhile, all this is happening. There's the some dodgy dealings with a guy who's renovating the school. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a business manager because the school's running out of money or something. And so Mr. Robson's brought in this kind of CEO yeah. quite ahead of its time. And if you look at like, yeah. uh, like, um, academies, the, the, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. academies. And so, uh, so they're doing all this 
work. And meanwhile, there's like two sick form characters who are who are one of them's like messing with Mr. Hankins' head. Yeah. All, all I remember is we, Amelia and I end up running away. Yeah. And of course, when you're going to run away, the one place you're going to run to is the basement of your school. <laughs> the school, yeah. That is having loads of renovation done by a cowboy builder. And we ran away and then the school collapsed on us. Is yeah. That right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we managed to get out. And then there was there was definitely there was definitely a car chase of some sort. So I remember very excitingly we we had a day's filming where they had to close off the street. That yeah, yeah, them, that's that's right. As you say, you escaped from the school, but then bundled into a car. Yes, with, with by no a idea stranger. Of what's going on? Yeah, no idea what's happening in the car. And then of course we found out that the person who had kidnapped us was actually Amelia's father, uh-huh. who was on the run from the law because according to the government he'd committed some sort of crimes against the government that's right but he was actually innocent i think but he was were a, innocent to... yeah yeah and um it was a dictatorship wasn't it in east uhuru um yes. <laughs> and then and then the police came to the house and i had to i think my pet didn't my parents tell me that i had to pretend like i'd called them as a joke or something yeah. and so i had to basically take the rap would you look back it's terrible <laughs> But then, t- tying up nicely, the government in East Uhuru was overthrown, meaning that Amelia and, and her dad were safe. That's um, lucky. Yeah. Now, the next series, series 25, which was mm-hmm. 2002. Now, at that time, we'll get a little bit onto your story in, in a minute, but at that time, that was when Grangeville was told that it was going to be finishing. Is that... That's right, before it moved to Liverpool. With the actual show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we were told, um, I think while we were filming that series, we were told it was going to be the last one. Right. So, obviously, you know, I know people didn't know where you know where they were standing and, and stuff like that. And then there was things carrying on with it, moving off to Liverpool, which we'll get on uh, to in a moment. But that was it. Darren and Calvin became like... The wheeler dealers. Yeah, like the Gonchon, the Gonchon Hollow. Obviously, you'd been big wheeler dealers in the 80s on, on Grange Hill. They became sort of the, the Gonchon Hollow for a, the, the new millennium. And because there was the, the trading cards was a big thing in the that Destiny series. Cards. Yeah, the Destiny cards or amongst the girls. And they started to set up their, their business of selling them. Um, yeah, at one point there was they were looking at actually releasing Destiny cards for real. I mean, wow. Joe Ward, who was the producer at the time, coming and telling me and Arnie that um, that they were they were trying to team up with a, a, a you know a, a game manufacturer to uh-huh. actually release these Destiny cards to be available in shops at the same yeah. time as the show. Right. I get you. Which I was very excited about. <laughs> then it never happened, but uh, yeah. No, no, no that, that, that that's a shame. Like, and for some reason, and and, and I, was, I was when I was watching, I was trying to work out. They were very sort of cloak and dagger about selling them. When the, when the, whenever they got collared by any teachers, they wouldn't just say, "Oh yeah, we're selling them." They was, "Oh no, we're swapping them." <laughs> that was just the, we're swapping them to try and get dates with girls, which I just loved <laughs> about that. Um, but saying that to a teacher, that's why we're doing it because it was. Miss Fraser, the Australian teacher, uh, all the lads yes. fancied. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Darren actually then, when he's saying about we're, we're, we're doing it so we get better at talking to girls, and then he says to her, what are you doing at the weekend, miss? Um, <laughs> so obviously Darren was, you know, he, he, he'd he grown up, hadn't he, at this point, like by the time he was year, year 10. like. But they also... Is that, is that the year that we had the different school uniform? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a new school uniform there. They managed to get an advert onto the new school website, which Anika had been been made the, the editor of. Yeah. But also in that one, uh, Mr. Deverell had, had come in and Nick Tizard. Yeah, I mean, what 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 a guy! Um, what a guy! <laughs> like, I love that character because I, I I just I just think the character was was tremendous because he just went in all guns blazing, didn't he, into every totally single did. situation, like, and he saw. Darren and, and Calvin selling, but he didn't know what they were selling and yeah. automatically assumed that they were selling drugs. Uh, they were dealing yeah, drugs all, all over the school and Darren and Calvin got an exclusion at that point. And that was like sort of like, you know, your humorous story 
of that series. But then obviously, it's the second half of that series was about Amy and Amy's yeah. mum. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, Amy had uh, the worst luck in the world, didn't she? Uh, because obviously, yeah, like, she really did. She she found out about it. She found out about her dad, and at first she wasn't sure if her dad was going to want it. No way. But then she also found out that, that her mum had, had cancer and was at end of life, mm-hmm. basically. Now, and, and I love, there's a scene with Darren and Amy, and you start thinking, I wonder if anything's going to happen with Darren and Amy. But then I think then it just became apparent that they were just really good mates. And the fact that Darren, to, to bring Amy luck, gave her a full set of Justini trading cards as well, which I... <laughs> I, I love that, like lovely gesture, but yeah, <laughs> he's slightly misplaced. Yeah, and then there's a there's a uh, there's a scene where they all go round to see Amy's mum, mm-hmm. um, and it is all a little bit uncomfortable, certainly for for Calvin more than anyone else. Yeah, when you were filming that scene, because it looks quite tense, you know, the, certainly the, the the initial part. Did it feel like that at the time? Can if you can remember, like. No, I mean, I think I seem to remember us being aware of the the nature of it. You know, uh-huh. you, you you could tell when certain times, certain storylines, it was all right to muck about and have a yeah. bit of fun. And then certain storylines, you knew it had to be taken a lot more seriously. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, certainly we were we were all, we weren't playing silly buggers. We were definitely being serious. Yeah. But, um. um but yeah, I mean, it was that's the great thing about the show, I think, is that it had that mix of, you know, ridiculousness like Destiny cards yeah. and, you know, being cheeky to teachers, but then wasn't afraid to have, you know, those sorts of things. I remember that that year there was um, an undercover reporter at BBC L Street where we were filming the show uh, from The Sun was nice. working in the canteen and there was a front page on the, su- on the News of the World on a Sunday It said... Um, Something like, why are we subjecting our children to this filth? And it was like, you know, a first lesbian kiss on TV, um, uh, the the rape storyline with Jess Davy Taylor's character. Uh-huh. Um, there was uh, Amy's mum dying of cancer. I think that was all the same. There was like a lot of yeah. like quite heavy stuff happening, and uh, and I think that's that was the amazing thing about the yeah. show. It would tackle those things, but because it was the BBC, they weren't just you know chucking stuff at it and doing it for, for salacious reasons. They were doing it because it started a conversation and it was handled very sensitively and it went through, you know, lots and lots of layers of people making sure that it was all safeguarded and it was all properly done and it was it was handled really well. I mean, Cy Spencer, the head writer on the show, you know, he had a whole writer's room that he would, they would work on stuff for so long, you know, you'd go in occasionally and ask what, you know, what was coming up next. Uh-huh. And if they would tell you, you know, they were always a bit cagey about giving stuff away because they knew that any ideas would have to be worked and worked and worked on and made sure that it went past the producers and then the exec producers and then the head of CBBC and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, nothing was ever done by chance. No, no, definitely not. And then, so we just mentioned that scene there where they went around to see Amy's mum and Amy's mum died later on that day. And that was also your last appearance Mm. Um, in, in, well, in the program. I am actually in the. I was in the final episode. All oh, right, in the episodes, but we, yeah. um, but I don't. Uh, I, weirdly enough, I don't think I'm in the credits for the very last episode. So I think right. maybe I didn't make it from the edit. But yeah. I was there for the. Uh... And you've just said there about being, you know, in the last episode, because that that was your, you know, your last appearance in the show, and you were only year ten. Mm. What What do you think happened? to Darren in the fire oh he died right okay yeah. yeah he died in the fire that's why he didn't go out to Liverpool because it was one of them wasn't it with the uh, you know I don't know if you ever saw the series afterwards the, the fire wasn't mentioned really no they weren't they weren't able to because of uh, um, but yeah because it was a can of worms that they yeah. were explain <laughs> yeah. that all these people died yeah uh, I mean the reason I didn't go is because it was uh I was about to start my GCSEs. Right. Uh, it was my, well, I'd done my first year of GCSEs because, yeah, it was year 10 and it right. was my GCSE year. And my parents had always said that they didn't want me to do acting during my GCSE yeah. year and during my A-level year. Yeah. So 
I mean, you because must be you, you must be one of those rare people who Simon Grangehill matched the, yeah. the actual school uh, years. Yeah, it totally did. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, did it totally match? No, it, well, I was a year. I was a year out because I think I was in year eight when I got the job. Right, I get you. Yeah. And was filming a year seven. Um, and yeah, so my, so I did four years on it. So yeah, I was, yeah, so. Oh, I, I get you. Right. I was just starting my GCSE right. year when I, it was my exams, basically. That's yeah. why I didn't, I didn't go cool. up. On there. Cool. So, I mean, how did you feel about having to leave? I mean, I was a bit gutted, definitely. Um, especially as the rest of my year went up with the show. Uh-huh. Um, but looking back, I'm quite glad I did go when I did right. because what we had at Ells Tree was quite special. Yeah. And I know from talking to the others, Liverpool was never really the same and there was a very different vibe and some people enjoyed it, but I know a couple of people really didn't enjoy it and it, right. it felt a bit like there was a slight us and them Oh, between, I get yeah, yeah. Between the original London actors and the new and the new cast, um, uh-huh. so um, yeah, I think at the time I was a bit sad, but yeah, looking back now, I think I'm really glad I left the show. Yeah. I did. And what was the did, did you get? Was there much of a public reaction to you when you were out on a boat at that time when you were on Green Hill? Not a massive one. Certainly, like if I was like at a party or at a school thing yeah then people maybe would have heard that i was in the show but uh-huh. it was only a couple of times that totally out of the blue i got recognized right um which i'm quite thankful for i mean i'm yeah. definitely thankful that i was in the show when social media wasn't around right I, I, it must be a very difficult yeah thing at that age to yeah. have to deal with that there was i remember there was definitely a forum there was an online forum because uh-huh. i remember going to the office once and they were telling me that um the, the, the it was the busiest the forum had ever been on the CBBC website for Great Hill nice. when um was and it was a thread all about whether Amelia and Darren were actually having a relationship. Nice. Apparently that was the big thing that everybody wanted to talk about online. Yeah. Um but yeah with Twitter and and the rest of it I think yeah it yeah. must have been a a very <laughs> Would have been a very different, different yeah. Time. So you, you've said there you never went on because of your GCSEs. So did you take? Because I've just looked there. There was a. Uh, obviously, I get my information from my MDB, and I always say I know it's not the most reliable. But there was a bit of a, a break, certainly for acting t- on telly work from when you left Grange Hill to Tom Brown's school days, and then from then you know the likes of was it Casualty nineteen oh seven you were in, and then it. Things. Yeah, so I, I actually I did an episode of Doctors the year after right. we finished the show. Uh, it's the year after I finished Grange Hill. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, I did... Um, the Tom Brown School Days is a funny one. I'm, I was never actually in that show. I just did a... I did a voiceover, voice yeah, yeah. Um, but it, oh, it somehow it got credited on IMDb. Yeah. Um, but then after that, I uh, I went to drama school. So I went to the right. Bristol Oh, right. there okay. for three years cool. um because i was auditioning for things I, i'd had this agent that had got me grain chill and and various other bits she um was putting me up for stuff and i remember i think it was a holby audition i was up for and i was chatting to the casting director and he said you know you're about to finish school what are you going to do next year and i said i'm thinking about going to drama school and he said that's a really good idea uh where are you thinking about going i said oh, i want to go to rada or Guildhall." Um, and he said, have you thought about Bristol? Uh-huh. And I said, I hadn't really. And he said, get out of London. Because if you're in London at drama school, the chances are I'm going to ask you to come and audition for stuff. Other <laughs> right. people are going to ask you to audition for stuff. And before you know it, you might get offered a part whilst you're still training. And you won't, you'll either leave drama school early or you'll kind of already be working when you should be training. He said, get out of London. And then I also met... Um, Jenny Seagrove, the actress. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, she was, like, doing something at my school. Like, she'd come to, like, open, uh, cut a ribbon or something at my school or something. Uh-huh. And uh, and I was I was always wheeled out at school whenever there was any... <laughs> right, <it's> okay. <laughs> ...any sort of opportunity. They were like, this is Adam, he does all the acting. And, uh, and yeah, I said to her I wanted to go to drama school because nobody had gone to drama school from my secondary school right. since, about the 60s. And uh, instead of where you think about going, and I said the same thing, or maybe Rada, maybe Lambda, wherever. 
and she said you should go to Bristol and I said you're the second person in the last few weeks to say that and she said it's it's a really good school I went there um and you you know you'll have a great time and so I was really lucky I got offered a place um which um was a bit mad because they only take 12 students right really? like yeah like two and a half thousand ish wow people. yeah yeah I was really lucky so yeah and it was the best thing I ever did because I went away for three years out of London and kind of had a bit of a chance to have the I don't want to make it sound like woe is me like I didn't have a childhood because I definitely did yeah uh, and, and it was a very fun childhood and I really enjoyed myself but there was an element of of working professionally yeah. from age I mean I, I did Oliver in the West End when I was nine I think right. so I was always working alongside everything else uh -huh. and so it was nice for three years to just study acting rather than doing it yeah and not so much pressure and you know do things wrong and find out what's wrong and then find out what's right and um um it was a really enjoyable time i had loads yeah. of fun and and then when i did graduate i was like right i'm ready to go back and and take this seriously and i know yes. chatting to some of the other people from my time in grange hill they didn't have the chance to go to great uh, to um to drama school and carried on acting and they did struggle sometimes yeah. because there's a it's almost like a, a like a like a certificate like a badge of honor thing of like when you've been to drama school people go okay cool yeah you're you're a real actor it's yeah like, yeah uh, um which is nonsense because there's no difference between you know you can either act or you can't yeah going to drama school doesn't really it teaches you how to stand up properly and how to <laughs> use your voice well yeah and how to do certain accents and there's lots of like really good techniques and skills you get at drama school but um uh, you know, I teach occasionally now, and they, right. you can't teach someone to act. They can either yeah. do it or they can't. It's just about refining the edges and putting yeah. situations to grow with it. Yeah. No, like So, obviously, you've continued to act, but I have to mention this, because not I don't know if many people will know this, but while you were in Grange Hill, you had a, a sideline, you had a side hustle going on in video games. <laughs> Now, is it true that you are the voice of Harry Potter on on many video games? Is is that true? It is true. It right. is true. So it was. It wasn't while I was doing French. It was right. just okay. after I left. So right. I think I started doing it when I was seventeen. Right. Okay. And uh, I didn't start as Harry. I got a job um, on the first video game, the Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. Right. Playing Marcus Flint, who's the head Slytherin chaser. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was great fun. I did the job, and then um, I, I think I then did what they then started doing a game per film, and right. I did I did another one playing Marcus Flint or something, and then uh, Dan Radcliffe's voice broke, right. <laughs> and it just so happened that David Heyman, who was the producer of the whole Harry Potter franchise, was around the studio listening when they were when they were like just checking through some tapes and whatever and heard me and kind of like did a double take and was like that that sounds just like Dan Radcliffe right. like, oh no this this is this is the guy who plays Marcus Flint in, in and he was like no 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 that guy's now gonna be playing Harry in the video games oh brilliant and so uh so yeah they they, they called up my agent and said does Adam want to stop playing Marcus and start playing Harry <laughs> which I said yes absolutely and we don't it's funny we don't have the same accent but no. we have a very similar tombra of voice right um which is yeah very very lucky yeah. and so i was on this there, there's there was this weird like list of um like order of people who got clips from set right. and i was like in like the top 10 people to get like stuff from the harry potter set i mean it wow. was like, you know, on pain of death sharing it with anyone yeah ever. yeah i used to get these mp3s of dan doing certain bits yeah um and uh, i'd kind of like uh, i'd play that over and over in my headphones but while i was doing the the video game uh-huh um and then i would go into the studio and do cuts for the film because there were you know a billion producers on that franchise quite often yeah. in the edit They'd get to a point where they'd say, oh, we, what would happen if maybe we, you know, rejigged the storyline so that that scene comes here and stuff? And all well, that would mean we'd have to have a line here so that, that bit makes sense. And so I would go into the studio and I would 
basically uh, put in extra lines as Dan to see if they worked or, or you know, if he was in yeah. Japan promoting the movie and they needed, uh, you know, extra breaths from him while he's riding a dragon. Yeah. I would go in and I would cover his breath and... So and... so are you in the movies as well as the games then? Your voice is in the movies, is it? I mean, yeah, but my voice that's in the movie is like, you know, you, you, you'd you hear maybe when he's like on a broomstick in a Quidditch match, you right. might hear me going, <laughs> rather than I mean, him that, going. <laughs> that's, that's, that, I, I think that's still pretty amazing, to be honest. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? It, it's massive. And it's definitely, I, I'd be dining out on that. I don't care. I'd, I'd be telling everyone that I'm in, <laughs> that, that I'm in that franchise. But obviously you, you've done quite a, a bit of voiceover work for, for games mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, other games. I was looking there, like the Dark Souls and Battlefield yeah, well, stuff. Yeah, so it's funny. I was in, I was working out in uh, um, LA doing a, a show uh, that I'd done in the West End, and we toured o- over to America. And I was chatting to a guy in LA, and you know, everyone in LA, in LA is in some way in the business. And uh, he was like, "What do you do?" I was like, "I'm an actor." And he said, "Why are you here?" And I was talking about the show and, and uh, he didn't look that interested because people in LA don't really care about theatre and I got onto the fact that I worked in video games and normally my Harry Potter story is like the one that people go oh that's really cool kind of everyone yeah and so I said it and he didn't really look that plus and he was like, oh you've, you've done any other any other video games and and I said oh I worked on Dark Souls and the guy nearly fell off his chair <laughs> He was like, he just became a fangirl he was so excited and yeah, yeah Dark Souls has this massive quite niche core audience who are absolutely obsessed with the games and especially with the voice acting side of it yeah i hadn't realized what a big deal it was so i did a couple of characters in dark souls the original and then a couple of characters in dark souls 3 um which is fun and yeah yeah, i'd worked on the latest battlefield and yeah i do quite a lot of voiceover stuff i tend to do the main thing i do is a um kind of like what i did on the the Harry Potter films. I do a lot of post-production right. kind of uh, ADR, we call it, or uh-huh. additional dialogue recording. So, like uh, the Bohemian Rhapsody, the the oh, Freddie yeah. Mercury film, uh, Freddie Mercury's breath for the entire film is my breath. Wow! So, well, when you're in a cinema and you're looking at a, a you know a massive cinema screen and there's a close-up of an actor's face, yeah. if there isn't a, a breath noise and the mouth is open our brain goes, that's not real, it doesn't work. Right. Whereas if there is a breath, then you don't even think about it. So right. all those, the, the attention to detail in films is, is yeah. bad. And then especially on the um, Bohemian Rhapsody film, it's Rami Malek obviously playing the, the character, uh-huh. but he, nearly all of the singing is either, excuse me, is either a, a sound alike, um, who's a really yeah. good Freddie Mercury impersonator, or more often than not, they took the original because they did so many recordings. Queen, they quite often record all their live shows. Yeah, and they would clean up the recordings for when the, for the studio tapes. They'd take off the breathing and stuff, so it was like a pristine live recording. And yeah. so the sound team had to basically go back in and put in all the breaths for the moment where he's on stage and like in between lines, he's like. <gasps> And then sings. Right. So I, uh, I for uh, you know a good, I think it was like a full day, like a full nine till six, like an office job. I went to the studio in Soho, and they gave me the Freddie microphone. Wow, <laughs> brilliant! Yeah, uh, and I just sang along to Live Aid, and they put a like a reverse gate. So basically, a gate's like a, when the 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 signal in a microphone reaches a certain threshold, it opens up and turns the gate on. So they did the opposite. So as soon as I started singing and I started making noise, they, the microphone would cut out. But in between, when you, it would just pick up all the... <gasps> yeah. And they'd kind of splice that in. Wow. In fact, they, the, the sound team won an Oscar for that film. Oh, brilliant. Again, I'd be having words there to make, you know, <laughs> to get one like... Um... <laughs> No, wow, that I mean that 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 sounds tremendous. To be honest, like no, I I, I love all, all stuff like that. I know that that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's funny. I was saying about um, LA. Actually, the weirdest thing that uh, same time when I was out there, and I met that guy. I was uh, I was doing it was, the show was called Backbeat. It was the story of the Beatles. Oh yeah, they yeah, started yeah. Out. We did it in the West End, then we took it to Toronto, then we took it to LA, and it just so happened it was the same time in LA that there were a couple of Grange Hill people out there. Right. So I went for lunch one day, and it was me. Uh, Ian, um, uh, John Hudson, who played Ian, yeah. Peter Morton, uh, 
uh, who else was there? Uh, Casey Barnfield, who played Maddie. Yeah. Uh, Arnold O'Cheng had just got a part in a movie, so he was out there. Uh, is there someone else? Basically, there's this photo of like maybe six of us from my time in Grange Hill, wow. all of us on Sunset yeah. Boulevard in Los Angeles. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really, oh, brilliant. Really cool. Brilliant. So you, you, you've mentioned people there. Are you still in touch with anyone from the cast now? Yeah, I am, actually. I, I, uh, I don't see people all that often, right. unfortunately. Um, but uh, John Marchant Heatley, he uh, uh, he uh, stopped acting. He, he ran a pub called The White Bear in Farringdon. Right. And when I first graduated from drama school as an out-of-work actor, he very kindly put me in a lot of bar shifts oh brilliant so, yeah. uh, so I'd always be uh, hanging out with him and then Jessica Stavely Taylor who is now singer yeah, supremo really and, well yeah and really yeah. well in a band called The Staves yeah so uh, I yeah I see because I, I spend half my time now as an actor and half my time as a musician mm. and so uh, I, I kind of run into Jess quite a lot which is great um and yeah, get to see her play, and she comes to my gigs occasionally, which is great. She's yeah. doing really well. Um, who else do I see? Like, uh, uh, I, I mean, I still chat with Arnie quite often. We haven't managed to actually see each other right. in ages. Yeah, but um, but yeah, we 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 still swap messages. Um, and Dan Lee, Daniel Lee, because Dan Lee play who played Ben. Yeah, I think. yeah. So he um. He and I used to share a car into work every day. Right. So before we'd even started filming, Dan and I would have spent a good... Because he lived in Bromley and I grew up in West Wickham, uh -huh. which are next door to each other. And when you're under 16, you're not allowed to get public transport because you have to be chaperoned. Mm -hmm. So they used to send a car and it would pick me up and then it would drive to Dan's house and it'd pick him up. And then we'd go all the way around the M25 for two hours, sit in traffic. <laughs> We get to work. So Dan and I would spend a lot of time together in the back yeah. of the taxi. Um <laughs> So yeah, he uh, I again I haven't seen him for for a little while, but we always we yeah. always send a message. And every so often that you know, we do have the very occasional Grain Chill reunions. Yeah. It's been a while since our last one and maybe every couple of years we'll have like yeah. a message will go around and say, Let's let's do it and then it never comes to anything. I think <laughs> Jalpa's wedding was probably the last time. Right. So she uh -huh. got married in like twenty 2017 right and me and Lindsay, who played amy and jess david taylor and dan lee were uh -huh. there. oh um, cool well it is um it was mentioned on the on the last podcast there is a, a great deal reunion event coming up in february is there so yeah i think tickets are now on sale and from what i've heard they're going really really fast as Amazing. well and that's the 12th of february at the tabernacle in notting hill so if you're available that'd be amazing if you could get there for that adam um Amazing. so as, as we are nearly at the end uh, adam and i've just got a few questions left for you um and they're all about grain chill they're all grain chill related um great so um, it's been mentioned it, the, the, earlier on in the year it was the talk of a grain chill movie being yeah, made, got Phil Redmond and stuff. What do you think of the idea of that? Yeah, great. Give us a call, Phil. <laughs> I, uh... I mean, would we see a return of the, the ghost of Darren Clark? <laughs> ghost of Darren Clark, <laughs> just wandering around in the background. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. Uh, I mean, it's such a great show. It's a shame it, it it had to stop. I mean, I guess all things must come to an end. Yeah. Um, but... Um, do you know why? Do you, do you know what Phil Redmond's plan was? Uh, so, uh, don't uh, know. When, come on, exclusive. I, yeah, I, come on. Exclusive. <laughs> I, I, I got told that he, when he bought back Grain Chill, he tried to buy Grain Chill back a couple of times. Right. Because he wanted to create a super soap. He wanted to have uh, a kind of like, several shows where the characters were slightly interchangeable. So oh, that right. yeah. the families would live on Brookside Close. Right. And then the teenagers would go to Hollyoaks College. Uh -huh. And the children would go to Grange Hill. Oh, right. And he'd been trying for years to get the rights back from the BBC for Grange Hill to be able to do this. And, and they kept on saying no. And because obviously Brookside and Hollyoaks were Channel 4 yeah. and Grange Hill's BBC. Um, and yeah, he oh, did never knew that. the show back. Yeah. But yeah, they, they wouldn't let him cross, cross the show. Oh, that would, have been, that would have been something, that wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so then other than Darren Clark. Who was your favourite character in Grange Hill? Oh, good question. 
Um, I mean, I was all because I because the Double Dare gang were like a couple of years ahead of me. Yeah, I always remember thinking their storylines look really fun. Yeah. they got to they got to muck about quite a lot. Um, yeah, and then the um, who was it? Um, the two sick formers who had the thing with Mr. Hankin when I was so, like, yeah, so Danny and Ozzy. Yeah. Max Brown and and yeah, I can't remember the guy who played. Also. No, I can't yeah, think. I that Kieran's, they, Kieran's they, name, I can't think of it. <laughs> they were uh, they were like really tall and a bit older. Yeah, and, uh, they, I think they wore leather jackets. Do you know what I mean? They were just cool. And he had a motorbike, didn't he? As well, like you know, yeah, all, all exactly. that. Like, yeah. Your so thirteen-year-old me thought they were yeah. really cool. So if you and so that that's my next question is usually like you know if you couldn't have played Darren, is there another character you would have liked to have played? I'm guessing it would have been one of them. As yeah, well, would it? Would yeah, Danny. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, cool. yeah. So then, so then, so the last question then, Adam, is why do you think there's still such affection for Grange Hill? I mean, I guess uh, because it did something that no other show was really doing. I don't really think many shows have ever been able to quite capture since it. It was, it was a show for the age group of the people that it was made by. So it was, it was a show for kids. Not necessarily made by kids, but focusing on kids, and yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't a teeny show. It wasn't a kiddie show. It was, it was serious, and yeah, you know, a lot of parents wouldn't allow their kids <laughs> to watch it because yeah. it was there was an element of of subversiveness and an element of danger there, and um, yeah, it did so many firsts. You know, yeah, I don't think there have been many lesbian kisses in children's TV. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, I don't think many people have faced because, and you know, things that you know happen to real life kids, get you know, being bullied, being sexually assaulted, horrible things that happen to people in everyday life. Yeah. And being able to look at that through a lens and see, you know, how you might be able to deal with that, I think it was so important. But at the same time, it wasn't all doom and gloom. It was a really fun show and it had a lot of heart. And yeah, I'm really proud to have been able to yeah. be, been a been a part of it. Yeah, no, I can tell. I can tell you are just from listening to you and, and talking to you. I, the word it gets used a lot, and I say it myself. But it was groundbreaking, wasn't it? It it was a groundbreaking. Mm. You know, the, the fact that you did have those storylines and it didn't shy away from them. Did yeah. it? You know, it, it it showed kids what was out there. And I I've said this a few times is that I think my parents let me watch it because it was like that. And I know yeah. a lot. I know a lot of parents. Didn't let their kids watch it because it for was like fact. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Adam, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks um, so much for having me. It's been really, really great talking to you about it. And as I say, I, I can tell how proud you are and how much you you, you, you love being in, in, in Grange Hill as well. So thank you so much uh, for your time. And for anyone that's listening, I'll speak to you next time. Cheers. Thanks. Nice one. Thanks so much. No worries. Bye-bye.